Rugby on Off the Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. Now our next guest is very quietly carving out a very impressive coaching career. Played for Munster between 01 and 06 and again for the 09 season as well. On retirement he became director of rugby at Young Munster. And then big break from a coaching perspective came at Grenoble where he went in initially as the skills coach. That was between 2013 and 2017. He was then backs coach at Oyonnax from 2017 to 18. Then backs coach at Stade Francais, 18 to 19. And then as of 2019, he's been the backs coach with Racing 92. Great to welcome Mike Prendergast to the show. Mike, how you doing? Good, Joe. Thanks a million for having me on. No, great to have you on. There's obviously an all French European final with a Munster twist as well at the weekend, so we might pick your brain on that, I'm sure. How often is he on to you now? A few times a week, stealing your ideas? Uh, we, uh, we, no, it's not like that. It's the other <laughs> way around. Uh, no, we speak quite regularly. I was on to him uh, this morning and he's in good spirits and looking forward to a big game on Saturday. Well, listen, you're carving out a really, you know, varied, interesting career and it seems to be going well. Just to get yeah, a few words on you as a player first, Mike, I know it probably feels like ancient history. I don't know how often you, you think about the old days that much. So you were at Munster um, in the senior squad for those five years. There was that pesky Peter Stringer fella ahead of you for a lot of it. So how was the playing career? I know a couple of injuries thrown in as well. How did it go for you on the whole? How do you look back on it? Yeah, with fond memories, I think it was it was great times. Um, I suppose that journey was starting out with with Declan Kidney as head coach at the time, and everything was new, and it's, it just really snowballed. Um, but great memories when I look back. Obviously, you'd wish to have played more, but to be fair to Peter, he was he was in there, and uh, he was a fantastic scrum half who played nearly hundred times for Ireland as well. So, um, in between my career, I, I, I decided to to make a change as well, and I, I moved abroad. I went to actually to France to Bourg one for a season. Mm. And I played a year in Gloucester, and then went back to Munster from from my final year, which was which was a nice thing to do as well. But uh, just all really good fun memories, and um, and obviously still in contact with a lot of the, the ex Munster players, and um, you know it was, it was great days. So you didn't find it demoralising, frustrating to be maybe in the twenty three, but not getting the game time that you wanted. Uh, being honest, I did. I did. I was in, as competitive as anyone. I just, uh, you know, you want to play as, as much rugby um, as you can because you train as equally as hard as anyone else. Um, but look, that's just the way the, the ball broke. And as I said, I had a very good scrum half ahead of me mm. in Peter. Um, but as I said, only fond memories when I, when I look back and, and think of it, you know. Yeah. I was reading that you had a couple of injuries early on, a cruciate and I think a shoulder injury as well. Mm -hmm. And there was maybe a threat to the career or certainly a chance this thing could wind up early. Clearly, you realised you wanted to stay in the game. So you're one of these players who got their head around the idea of coaching pretty early, I think. Yeah, that's exactly it, Joe. Um, I actually, when I was 23, I think it was, I did my, my shoulder, I got reconstruction. So I was out for six months. And unfortunately, my first game back, I, I did my cruciate. So overall, it spanned oh. over a year. So I wasn't sure would Munster keep me on. So uh, with the second injury... I just decided that, uh, you know, as you said, I wanted to stay in the game and would I have been able to continue. And fortunately enough, um, Munster kept kept on to me uh, through those those injuries. And but in in the meantime, I, I started a bit of coaching locally with with clubs and um, and I just got the taste of it. And I kind of I knew where I wanted to go. And and then as a player, um, having that opportunity to to play in in France in the top fourteen and in the Premiership as well was, was something appealing for me as a player, but also. I wanted to experience something uh, something different um, because I suppose I had one eye potentially in the future if if something um, came up. Unfortunately, it did, and I think it's mm. it's you know those two way those those two years sorry away I think stood to me as well in my coaching career afterwards. You know how so? Um, just I suppose getting the experience to, to play in France, see what it was like. Um, I actually did a year here, and I'd signed for two years, but. Um, there was an option to go to Gloucester and it was probably easier for me my, my, especially my partner at the time because uh, we came to Bourguan it was a small little town um, there wasn't a huge amount uh, going on I suppose for, from my partner's point of view because you know for us it's easier we've been in meeting 40-50 players every day but for my partner it was probably a bit different and um, we kind of made a decision just before Christmas to take up the, the Gloucester offer and, and you know what when I left it was only kind of a year after I looked back and I I always regretted leaving France, so 
um, right. just to see what was was over here and the opportunities it could create. And, and then fortunately, um, through through Bernard Jackman, I got back into uh, yeah. into into France through Grenoble. And Mike, in those playing years, when you're thinking about coaching in the afterlife, mm. rugby is such a technical sport, such a coach led sport. Are you like Oli Gunnar Solskjaer? at home every night after training taking down what was done in training and trying to almost document how a team was run I mean did you throw yourself into it in that kind of a way or was it more just uh, observant and keeping a, an eye on things almost I think it was a bit of both really I think um, when I had the injuries as I said I, I thought of my, my career would finish up playing so I needed to, to or I wanted to go to go to keep in the game and, and to coach and um I just think, um, yeah, I suppose I would have been a student of the game growing up even. And um, I was fortunate enough to have some very good coaches pass through Munster as well. And mm. I, I would have, I suppose, yeah, I would have been maybe a bit of a rugby geek growing up and taking those notes and, um, you know, for thinking of, about the future. And then a, a bit of it as well when I when I went abroad. I did my coaching badges, obviously, in Ireland, but I did them in England also as well. So, um as I said, there was there was always probably that want that I wanted to, mm. um, or that desire that I wanted to go coaching, but it probably went off my head earlier than, than expected because of the injuries, you know. How much has the game changed? How much of the things that were being said in the dressing room from a structural point of view or a tactical point of view across those five years at Munster are useful to you now in 2021? Is it totally different? Um, ah, there is a lot different in terms of, of the technical and the tactical aspect the game has has moved on it, it, it's a game that changes quite quickly actually um, but the values are still there you know and, and um, I think a big thing for me as well as a coach um, is the managing side of it and I was fortunate enough to be coached by, by someone like Declan Kidney who had really really good management skills mm. player management skills you know and, and that's something um, I suppose I it was an experience, a good experience to go through, and it's something that I that I've held on to, or sorry, that I've taken on into my coaching um, pathway, and it's it's a big part of what I try to do as a coach as well. Is just yeah. building relationships with players, you know. I find it, it is amazing the pace at which the game changes, maybe more so than lots of sports. Like you take even Ireland, top of the world in 2018, and by the mm -hmm. World Cup the following year, the game plan has been worked out. You know, that's, it's, it's redundant almost is how quickly it changed. Yeah. So if you were to kind of, in a, in a very blunt way, admittedly, but I'm sure the rugby geeks uh, would be curious to know, what are the big changes, say, over the last 10, 12 years? Or, or what have been maybe the different points of emphasis or, 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 or kind of phases in the sport? Like, I feel like Rook was a big thing and Joe Schmidt made the Rook really important. And yeah. there's less of a focus on that, on that now, perhaps. I don't know. Well, you can't not have much focus on the Rook at any era, I suppose. But are there different kind of phases the game has gone through maybe in the last decade that you could almost, in, again, in a blunt way, almost summarise? Yeah, I think, look, the speed of ball, maybe the speed of ball, going back even seven or eight years ago to try and get a ball under three seconds, there wasn't too much chat around that. And now it's a massive part of it. Uh, and I suppose, especially in Ireland, you know, with, with Josh Mate, who was, um, you know, tactically or technically very, very astute around that rock area. Mm. Um, I just think, look, the game has moved on, but in saying that, you don't want to confuse things. So, um, and I suppose working in France is something that, maybe has, 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 has highlighted that for me that it, it's really important to get your message across very clear very simple very precise mm. um, and very direct but the thing is you obviously want to add in your bits of ingredients and you want to add in your bit of detail around it but you know first and foremost and I think it's something that working in France has probably highlighted that because of the language barrier so I'm trying to get my message across obviously in French mm. um, I want to make sure that, that they're understanding it so I'm trying to make it as simple as I can, um, and then as you said, kind of that's that's early week. You 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 put in your your big rocks, we call them, um, for the weekend, and then you add in your ingredients and your your smaller detail um, during the week. But how the game has evolved, it's just evolved in so many ways. You you know, trying to break down defences now. I suppose going back a number of years ago, yeah. okay, there was a rush rush defence there. Now you're getting an organised rush defence. You know, you look at La Rochelle, what, what I suppose Raj has brought to me from a defensive point of view, mm. having played against them a few times, um, they're a hard team to, very hard team to break down. Um, and that, I think, is especially for, for an attack coach, I think the, the challenges are there. Yeah. Um, it's about trying to find space. There, there'll always be space in the pitch, but 
I think it's about how you find it, you know, and the best yeah. ways of doing it. Yeah, the rush defence, the organised rush defence has definitely been a huge thing the last couple of years. But And then mm. uh, the days of having three in the backfield seem to be gone mm-hmm. as well. You know, it's generally two at any one time. And then, look, we'd have Ronan on the show plenty of times as well, and he would use that phrase you you've, you have just used, which is there's got to be space somewhere. So suddenly mm-hmm. if it's only one or two in the backfield and there's a defence of 14 rushing up against you, then you've got to start kicking more. So th- I guess that's mm-hmm. how all these things evolve. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, offensive kicking is a, is a massive part of the game now, um, and it can be a massive, I suppose, attacking tool. And um, it's something here where we, in Racing, we're fortunate enough to have a guy like Finn Russell that his short kicking game is, is very effective, and he, he can do it so late. And I think it's got to do as well what way you're set up. And um, you know, it's, it's all well and good saying you're going to kick the space, but you want to kick to to win that ball back and. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of teams that play, most teams play different systems. You've teams that, that leave flankers on the edges, so wingers will go infield, so they can go in around the 15s and work around their 10 um, as options. But then you have your, your two back rows pulling the edges, so staying in the five-meter channels that you'll always have that kicking option if your winger does go. You know, if your winger stays, the back row's pushed in. So mm. there's all these little intricate, intricate see, sorry, that, uh, that make it interesting and... and um, and there's, as I said, there is always ways to, to find space. But you're right in terms of the backfield. You know, teams now are defending with two in the backfield, 13 in the front line, um, and that becomes obviously a, a bigger challenge. But I think then, when you're talking about that as well, you know, I know Ron alluded to about obviously the offloading game, and and also your rock as well. If if you know, you've got to be able to go through probably multi phases to hold on to that ball if you're coming up against 13 defenders in the in the front lines your rook needs to be um, your rook needs to be very very accurate mm. and one last one because I do want to talk to you primarily about your career in terms of like the great innovations in the game the received wisdom would be that the New Zealanders the Kiwis are ahead of the rest when it comes to innovative thinking do you agree with that and is that still the case? Uh, I'm not sure I, I think from a skill point of view yeah. yeah I think their skill levels are incredible you know um, and again working with different players and just the different philosophies over here. Um, I've alluded to before, and even in our club here in wrestling, we've 10 different nationalities. So mm. you're always, you're always, you know, I'd be quite an open, open-minded coach. So I like little discussions with players and seeing their side of, of um, what way they look at the game or, you know, if it's, if it's a 3v2 or whatever it may be. But um, I think one interesting thing, if you look at the Kiwis, I suppose over, over the last number of years or, or previous years, we would have been talking about keeping depth, keeping depth. You know, the Kiwis are all about staying quite flat, but they have the ability just to catch that ball early and, and you know, rip it across or, or just that little little uh, tip on pass or whatever it may be. So yes. I think from a, an in, innovative point of view, I, I think, for example, Ireland or, or France or, or a lot of nations are up there, but I think their skill set under pressure, under fatigue is something that um, maybe they're still ahead of Right. And actually, one last one, then I do want to get back to your career, but it's so interesting, all these answers. Uh, you went in as skill co- skills uh, coach initially at uh, Grenoble. Where are we, Ireland, when it comes to skill? It's, it's been talked about quite a bit here, obviously, over the last uh, year, 18 months, um, particularly as things went awry, I suppose, post-2018. Where, where, where is the skill set? Where are we focusing enough on that un- at underage level? What's your sense? Um, I suppose. Look, I'm, I'm I'm out of the loop for nearly eight mm. years, but looking looking from from afar, um, you look at I suppose Leinster in terms of their skill set, their skillful team, um, their skill sets are quite high. Uh, I think Ireland have probably um, you know changed their game on on how they want to attack, um, and it takes time. You know, when you're when you're implementing an attack system, um, that takes a bit of time. And but a system is one thing. So you have your your as I call it your your um, your framework, um, and you want players to express themselves within that framework, and that usually comes down to how skillful you are um, and how good a decision maker. So they kind of go hand in hand for me. And uh, I think, look, yeah, it's probably something that that needs um, always to be worked on um, in terms of your your, your skill level. Um, but the, there are the players definitely at home um, in the provinces. Um, you look at even someone like Connacht. Um, you know, they play a, a nice brand of rugby that um, challenges their skills often in, in, in tough weather conditions as well. So mm. it's obviously an area that they have focused on. 
Um, and I know going back to the Pat Lamb area, that was something that he was massive on, and, and it just shows, I, I think, yeah. how much um, how much that, that that benefited them, you know. Well, the, the really interesting thing about the Lamb era was that he turned it around with adults, mm. you know, because when we have these conversations, we we start saying, well, we have to get it implemented at grassroots and it has to be from underage all the way up. And it was, you know, the received wisdom might be that a 25 year old isn't really going to massively improve the skill set. And yet Pat Lamb made them all take a ball home with them and have a ball mm. at all times. And, you know, a year later, you start to see the benefits. That was what was so interesting about Lamb. But yeah, uh, back to you. So if you've just tuned in, we're talking to Mike Prendergast, who's obviously backs coach now at Racing. Munster for those few years, the playing career, and a little bit in France, and a little bit at Gloucester, and then you retire. And I know you went in as director of uh, rugby at Young Munster, or Young Munsters, as you called them. This was a big talking point in our uh, news round. Don't worry about it. We'll come back to it another time. Um, the big name players, uh, Ronan O'Gara, Paul O'Connell, uh, they have you know they, they, they their names right across the rugby world. For you, as a lesser name, trying to forge a career, trying to get a break at professional level. How difficult is that as, as a Mike Prendergast as opposed to an, an O'Connell or an O'Gara or an O'Driscoll if you wanted to go into it or any of these guys? How hard do you have to beat down a door to get a chance, Mike? Well, that's exactly, I suppose, Joe, what I did have to do. Um, I remember doing up, uh, when I was at Young Monsters, first of all, that I, I massively appreciate the, the role and that they, um, they created for me in Young Monsters. It was a full-time role and it was, a, it, it, was, it was a great gig, actually, because you were literally touched on everything. Director of rugby, which were I was head coach, was still playing actually a bit as well, so there was a bit of fun in it as well. Right. Um, but it definitely gave me a good grounding. Um, and I'll, as I said, I'll always be grateful to, to your monsters because there wouldn't have been too, too many full time roles at the time with club, true club rugby, I should say. Mm. Um, and then I literally, yeah, I literally got my, my CV done up and I contacted people. Any contacts I had from around the world, from coaches like Alan Gaffney or Jim Williams to to people, fortunately, someone like Bernard Jackman was was in uh, was in Grenoble. And look, the question I suppose you're asking me, yeah, there is probably there is bigger barriers to to overcome mm. um, when you don't have a high profile, I suppose, um, playing career. Um, but it was something that I was, I was, I was very driven. I, I wanted to to get there, and I do what I have to do, yes. and I go to where I have to go to get the the opportunity. And again, thankfully, thankful to to Bernard Jackman that. He opened that door in Grenoble, and yeah. um, it kind of, kind of, from a professional point of view, it kind of started from there. So, how many people do you think you might have reached out to then in this period? Like, how how many doors did did you, did you knock on? Honestly, about I'd say thirty or forty. Oh wow! Minimum, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have. Yeah. So, so that's yeah, that's yeah. that's thirty or forty people potentially saying, "Look, Mike, I'll keep an eye open, but there's nothing at the moment." Type calls. Yeah, absolutely. And most people, you know, will come back to you through the contact or whatever it may be. And there's even players that would play that I played with. Sorry, that might have got coached by a coach that was still in the game. And yeah, I just literally. Uh, I knocked on a lot of doors, and, and fortunately, one of them, uh, mm. one of them opened through Bernard. And did you lose faith? Like, because I heard you saying, I think it was with the Limerick leader you did an interview, and you were saying, you know, even like someone like Ian McGeek, and you get to him through mm. on Redden, and you, you, you mm. know, this is the network, I guess. This is how it works. At any yeah. point, did you think to yourself, God, this ain't, this ain't happening, or were you pretty confident something would happen? I, I did really, to be honest with you. Um, I remember it was my last year with Munster, so I, I signed on with them for, for four years when I finished up with Munster. And uh, I was kind of coming into the last year and I had been, I suppose, doing it for maybe a couple of months previous to that and over the summer and then we're into the last season. And I know from just from a financial point of view, even with your monsters, things were, um, I suppose, tighter naturally. It's, it's, it's a club game and it's a full-time role I had. So it was very difficult for them to, to keep it going. And I was, yeah, I was starting to think, will this, will this ever happen? But mm. um, fortunately, as I said, um, yeah. Bernard contacted me and, and, and did you know him or again was that through uh, teammates of yours you know Bernard or how does that work I would have just I would have known Bert kind of not, not too well I suppose it was more through Paul and, and Quinny really right, um, right. they would have obviously played with him and, and known him quite well and um, I think it was Quinny that put me in contact with, with Bert and um, he kept he kept me updated and fortunately as I said uh, Grenoble were looking for a skills coach um, through Fabrice Landry, who was the director of rugby, he was looking for one, and he, he sounded Birch out. And originally, they wanted to do a, a three-month um, kind of, a, I suppose, a trial run for the for the summer and see how it went. But 
I was moving lock, stock and barrel over family and everything. So mm. we decided on a one year and then fortunately that that went okay. And, and you know what, Joe, it was a great place to go in because I suppose I didn't have the language. I, I, I played maybe seven or eight years, four or five years previous. So I had bits and pieces of, of French, but it was, a, it was a very good role to, to start off. And as a skills coach, it kind of, it let me go in. Um, you know, I wasn't presenting videos. I wasn't, I wasn't under the pump as such. And it just allowed me to forge uh, relationships. And especially it allowed me to, to get my language and to, to learn the language, I should say. Mm. And that allowed me then in turn to, to build relationships with, with players, with the staff, because obviously you're in France, you need to speak French, and, and that was the first thing that, that, I, that I wanted to do. You clearly made a huge impression over there. I say that because you were with Grenoble for four years and then you went to Oyonnax, and there were two back-to-back relegations, which I'm sure is no fun, like long, miserable seasons at times if Grenoble are going down and then the next place you go to, they go down. So, I mean, the fact that not only are you not tarnished by that, but actually... You go to Stade Francais and I further enhance your reputation. And then I think Toulon were interested in you and Racing mm-hmm. were interested in you. So clearly word had got around the game that this guy is really worth having around. If both Toulon and Racing are coming in for you, that, that must I mean, give you an amazing sense of confidence. I'm sure you're kind of wondering how is word getting around, but clearly people talk in the game and they're saying good things about you. Yeah, I suppose just to, to go back to Grenoble and, and Oyonnax, they were. There were two two years uh, consecutively we got we were relegated, so mm. that was tough. But there was a lot of learnings in that, uh, good learnings that that you take forward because you you need to see that side of it as well. Yeah, the French um, the French put, press weren't putting it down as the Prendergast effect, were they? Uh, I don't know. I hope <laughs> not. No, I didn't see it anyway. Maybe they were. <laughs> but um, and then um, Heineken Mayer contacted me when I was in Oyonnax and I came to Stade Francais for a year and Paul came over, Paul O'Connell, so we got working together and um, it was a good year. It was, we actually ended up, I know out there in the in the public domain, it kind of might have come out as positive, but we, we, we ended up, I think it was eight, and we were three points off six from a team that had the previous two years and then they got relegated. So we were on the right road. It was just, being honest, it was just our rugby philosophies were, were probably a small bit different. And then uh, it's just, look, timing has a lot to do with it as well. Um, Laurent Labitte, who is the French backs and attack coach, mm. he left Racing at the last moment. And I was actually going, yeah, you're right, I was going to Toulon with Patrice Calazzo, who was previously with La Rochelle. I played with him years ago in Gloucester. So rugby world is quite small mm. that way. And mm. uh, he contacted me to see would I be interested in going down there. And um, I was literally on my way and I got a phone call from... From Laurent Travers, the, the head coach in in wrestling, and kind of materialised like that, you know. And um, they, uh, they, yeah, they, they, they made me an offer for four years, which was which was great as well, great. I have to yeah. say, because to get four years in in professional sports is a massive bonus. But especially, I had moved my family around France a bit as well. And mm. I have three young kids now, but I had two kids at the time, so. so uh, so yeah, it was um, a good bonus to get. That must be tough. So the three kids, I think three daughters, I think um, from maybe a mid-teenager right the way down to almost relative newborn territory. I mean, it's something even Ron Nogara talks about, like the guilt of moving them from this school to that school. And, you know, you, you don't want to be doing that too much. I, I, I guess you have to have a few of those conversations around the family table. Yeah, that, that, that isn't easy. But uh, I have a daughter, she's 16, Emma. So she's uh, she's been at a... A lot of different schools, we just say. So uh, that's been challenging on her. Um, but I think it's something that will, will make her stronger in the future. She's fluent in the language. I know mm. Roger would speak about it, obviously, as well. And he had a harder path in terms of travel. He, he went to New Zealand and back. So mm. it, it isn't easy. It isn't easy. We've, we've understandable wives. And uh, I suppose they see where, where we want to get and what we want to do. And and, and, and they're, they're backing you. And, and as I said, I've... I've two younger girls as well, so the move for them. I've, I've got less than a year old, so she's only known uh, Boulan in Paris. So, um, and Freya, my other girl, is is five. So it hasn't been a huge adjustment for her as such, but um, or a huge change, I should say, for her. But mm. for my sixteen year old, it was, and obviously for my wife as well. But look, we're here in Paris. We've been here for three years, and we're two years now in wrestling. So, um, and, and thoroughly enjoying it. Good. Uh, I guess what a cool place to. Well, one be living and then racing. I mean, discos on the pitch after matches is a long way from 
where you came through playing your rugby. You know, there's a uh, bit. A long way from Greenfield. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. There's a bit of razzmatazz there off the field and on the field. Uh, we were just saying we, when we were saying you were coming on the show earlier on, we were remarking on the fact that uh, as a backs coach, you got a pretty cool group to work with there. Yeah, it's a it's a it's an incredible club. The facilities, Jackie Lawrence, their owner, looks after us incredibly well. From our from our, our daytime facilities to to where we we play in the in the arena and. Erasmus has that goes with it and whatnot, and and then as you said, look, we we yeah, we've quite a special backline that, um, and, and we're after adding to it there recently with the with Gail Fico coming over mm. from uh, from Stade Francais, he came over there about three weeks ago, so yeah. himself and Jeremy Beckettauer are are, are uh, have their partnership um, back together as well. Obviously, they play with each other with France, so um, they were both in yeah, look, well, Fico in frightening form in the Six Nations as well. Yeah, yeah, and I I. I coached him previously as well in Stade of course, yeah. great player and a great fella as well so um, yeah look there's 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 an impressive back line there um, and yeah they're, they're they're fun to work with and Mike do you work on things like you know a lot of starter plays and set moves or is it far more let's you know uh, a jouer let's be free just lads play up and you're working more on skills or you're, you're trying to mix a bit of both How, what, what kind of stamp are you trying to put in these guys yeah, so I would do the, I mean, the attack and back scout. So I would work from first phase strikes to our, our basic our, our attack framework. Everything we do from it from from first phase through through multi phase. Um, I look after the rock as well. Uh, it was an area I suppose I upskilled myself through working with Paul O'Connell, who in turn had worked with and, and been coached under Joe. Yeah, um, and it's a similar kind of system. So um, so yeah, look, there's, there's a framework there as as I call it, and. Um, and I just asked the lads to go out and, and you know, I suppose uh, express themselves as best they can within that framework. And, and I encourage, you know, good decisions on a Monday when we look at the videos or during the week after training. And mm. um, and I think the players kind of, you give them a bit of freedom within it, um, you know, but with the skill set and the players we have, uh, I think your job is made a bit easier. But, yeah. you know, they do want things tangible. So um, everyone has their roles w- within that framework. Um, and especially around the rock area, or you know, if you're playing off nine, playing off ten, and yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I'd look from from I'd look at from basically from first phase all the way through. I've seen you asked elsewhere who's really impressed you, and it's interesting you've gone for Finn Russell a lot of the time, and mm. unfairly or otherwise, Finn Russell would uh, in certain quarters be talked about as somebody too liable to make a mistake and then I don't know is he misunderstood or what Mike but I mean he might crack a smile afterwards and you're thinking my god if he does this on the Lions Tour in South Africa there'll be people blowing blood vessels next to him so uh, clearly there's a misunderstanding there or a disconnect for for a a lot of us looking at Finn Russell from the outside Yeah look uh, people have their own own views and what not but um you know, for us, he's a guy that, that turns up every weekend. Uh, I know at times people say he looks like a guy that's just after rocking up to the pitch on a, on a Saturday or whatever. But there's actually there's a lot of homework he puts in um, right. qu- quietly as well, which which I like. I have a good relationship with him. We would often have we sit down and have our, our coffee and our chats um, and how we're going to attack the game and um, and with the other tens as well. But he's a guy that does a lot of, as I said, homework behind the scenes. He's not the type who's massively vocal within the, the video room or, or on the pitch, but it's just little bits of detail, one worders, little lines or little you know phrases that he gets across, um, and he's got the respect of the players because of that and because of obviously what he does on the pitch. And mm. um, even on the weekend with a good win against Poe, and, and the guy can just do magical things. Mm. Uh, I know from the other flip side, people say he, you know. Um, his control of the game. I think it's something that's improved an awful lot. Uh, even talking to, to Gregor Townsend there, um, a couple of occasions we've spoken about that as well. And it's something he's definitely maturing as a player. And I think one thing he's added to his game um, from an attacking point of view, which was already very, very strong part of his game, is his, um, is his offensive kicking game as well. You know, he's, nice. we've, we've scored a lot of tries through that. With his, just his ability to on those half-field kicks, just pinpoint kicks for, for your wingers, or as you alluded to earlier, your back rows who are already out the edge. And it's a great, um, it's a great asset to have, and he's got, he's got an incredible skill set. But as I said, he does look like, for some people, that for some folk, that he's just turned up on the Saturday, he's rocked up, but the guy works hard up mm. behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. 
You mentioned the rook there. That's, you know, a little extra element that you're doing. It does seem as if Joe Schmidt has almost uh, gifted this great insider or, you know, expertise on the rook to a whole array of Irish coaches now. And they're almost kind of best in in class wherever they go. Is, is that kind of fair? As, as Did Schmidt kind of give all you guys, I guess you through O'Connell, kind of some, some serious uh, uh, tidbits or, or bits of knowledge there, which kind of tend to go a long way? Yeah, I reckon that's fair to say. Um, as I said, I, I'd never worked with Joe anything but through through Paul more so. Um, I had a good chat with actually Joe during during the summer about the rock, and we spoke about it. Um, and yeah, it was more so. I suppose look, it was it was um, it was through Paul that that uh, I suppose up, I upskilled myself, um, and he was very good at getting his message across. Mm. Um, and is it complicated, quite, Mike? Could you could you explain it to you know your uh, average you know coach what? in ten minutes? You know what, Joe? At the start, when I was looking at it, I, I thought it was. But once you once you go through it, quite as Paul says, do it in, in you know, for I suppose what the way they were, uh, short and sharp, not to have big long discussions about it. It was just little little points that he get across. Yeah. Um, big big folks, obviously, on the ball carrier, and then your two first arrivers. Um, but the thing I noticed about Paul is the same lingo day in day out. He didn't change it. He was just really consistent about it. And anyone that wasn't doing the role, he'd pull him, in, pull him on it. But he, he did it in a very, uh, I suppose, amicable way as well. That they'd react, and they reacted really well to it, you know, over here in, 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 in Stad when we were there. Because something like that was very new to, to a lot of the French players, especially. Mm. Um, but they bought into it. And they, see, they saw how much, uh, or what worth it was to us. And it allowed us to hold on to the ball. And even from a wrestling point of view last year, um, our rook became the quickest, fortunately, in in uh, look, winning collisions helps that as well. But our rook was, was the fastest in yeah. Europe last year. Right. Um, look, and, and also playing on that surface kind of helped us as well. But mm. um, it was something that, you know, you, there's something tangible there on a Monday that you can go back to around the rook area. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, you can have, absolutely, you can have Ben Russell, Birmi Vakatawa, Simon Zebo, etc., etc. But you need that quick rock ball. Mm. And look, uh, it's not just all about the rock. We, we, I know Roger's spoken about it, and we'll touch on it as well at times in terms of our offloading when when there's, when there's when it's the right time to do it or, or the right moment to do it. So it's not just all, you know, that you need that bit of a balance as well. Mm. But when we do speak about the rock, that, that things are quite clear on it, you know. Yeah, God, it's kind of an amazing thought. All the Aussies or New Zealanders arriving into Irish rugby for a period now, you've got all these Irish coaches going around the world and, and spreading their little pearls of wisdom. It's kind of amazing how the cross-pollination of the game works. So, um, listen, it's been great chatting with you and getting a, a sense of the career. Seems like it's going really well. Ambitions long-term, are you going to come back and be a head coach of a province? Is that the aim? Secretly written down in a journal somewhere or what's the thought? Honestly, no. As a head coach, I, I don't think I've, I've something that's not on the horizon at the moment for me. Um, I love doing attack. I know you can do be a head coach and an attack coach, but um, I think when you're a, a head head coach, um, there's a lot there's, there's a lot that goes with it. Obviously, I love the hands-on tracksuit job, as they say. Mm. Um, and at the moment, just really, really happy in in wrestling. Really happy in in France and um, and enjoying it. So. As of now, no, I'm, I'm happy out here, as I say. Good man. Well, listen, all those 40-odd phone calls worked out in the end. Great to see you doing so well. Uh, Mike Prendergast, great to have you on. Thanks so much, Mike. Cheers, Joe. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, continued success. So, Mike Prendergast there. Our rugby coverage on Off The Ball is with thanks to Vodafone, sponsors of the Irish rugby team, team of us, everyone in. It is a nil all between Burnley and Liverpool. 24 minutes on the clock in that game. Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. Volkswagen 0% PCP Finance offer makes it even easier to enjoy that 100% confident feeling you get from driving a new Volkswagen. That's 0% on the Polo, the Golf, the new Tiguan, and even the...